I'm Holly. I'm Leslie. And we We would would be be dead. Hey, Holly. Hey, Beans. Hello and happy Pride Month. Ooh, ooh. Yes, finally checking in in June. Been a lot going on over here. Yeah. We would be dead quarters. <laughs> we made it, though. We did make it. We're here. And We Would Be Dead devotedly supports the LGBTQ plus community. And so each June, we hold airspace for them. And most of us know that Pride began first and foremost as a protest. The Stonewall Uprising is where those protests and Pride began. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Exciting. Yeah, in a kind of roundabout way. We've done a lot of Pride cases. They're generally uh, a very personal account of an event that has happened. And we decided that this year we wanted to include some history because it's really important. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things that we talk about and events that happen come from the Stonewall Uprising and the history that led to it. So we figured it'd be good to help everybody understand it. And it occurs to me that this is a major event in American history that does not often see a classroom. Yeah. I didn't learn about this in any history class ever one time, Mm -mm. which is after the intense amount of reading I've done about it the past few weeks. I mean, I already knew what it was, but, but really digging into it, it's it feels crazy that it's not taught in American history classes because it's a major event in American history. And it's tied so heavily to other major events that are taught in American history. We teach McCarthyism. And this was a far wider reaching side effect of McCarthyism than anything else. Mm. So it's very interesting that we don't really have much of a focus on it. Not so much interesting as I guess I would say disappointing. Right, right, right. (laughs) And it's so much bigger and farther reaching than just a few days in late June of 1969. So we've endeavored to encapsulate the history that brought about the Stonewall Uprising and take you through the events that occurred and their effects on changes that are still being brought about today. So it should answer a lot of questions, but also leaving everyone wanting to ask more. Hmm. Right? That's the goal. And speaking of asking, we have a lot of ground to cover this week, so no beating around the bush. Okay. We need something from our beloved fiends. What? Something only they can give us. Hmm. Just a little pinch of... I don't know where I want to go with it. You knew it was coming! I know, and I forgot. (laughs) Just let your heart tell you. Validation. A hill worth dying on. Now that is a pride validation. Yeah. You found it found you. It did. I it think. really did. That was amazing. <laughs> and best of all, our fiends can give us this priceless ingredient free of charge. But how? But how, you must be asking yourself. Yeah. I can hear you doing it right out loud. <laughs> well, I will tell you. Simply head on over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star rating and or a friendly review. Mm. It really is the only way to move this podcast forward. Ratings and reviews equal attention, attention equals support, and support equals more and better content for all of you. That sounds so nice. Isn't it nice? Yes. But if you just can't wait for more We Would Be Dead in your life, don't worry, you don't have to. You can support us over on Patreon. I was feeling the spirit with you. Good. There for just a few dollars a month. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Good. (laughs) You will gain access to our entire catalog of 30-minute horror movies, special minisodes, our weekly after show, Host Mortem, which is available in both video and audio formats. Maybe you want to see our faces. Maybe you don't. Both are okay. You'll also get a special gift in the mail from us, giveaways, merch deals, an on-air toast dedicated just to you, and more. And we have more exclusive content in the works for our beloved patrons. Uh, but if you have anything you'd like to see, never hesitate to let us know. We like to take requests. That's fun. In all honesty, we are here thanks to our patrons. So come on over and be part of the We Would Be Dead family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if all of that is a little too much for you, you can simply follow us on social media. We are at Would Be Dead Pod anywhere and everywhere you get your content. 
you can like our posts, share our posts, like and share our posts. Mm -hmm. That's yes. That's the best one. Mm -hmm. That's how we know you like us. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that would be good. You can leave a comment, post about your favorite episode. Talk to us. We like that. Let us know when you're listening. Tell a friend. Tell a neighbor. Tell those uh, neighbors with a bar in their basement that they call a speakeasy. What are their names? Oh, Claude and Nancy. Claude and Nancy. Well, I'll tell you something. We definitely want them to be a part of the <laughs> yes. Wheel Dead family. They sound great. Then your friends and Claude and Nancy can become fiends. They're already fiends, let's face sure. it. They just don't know it yet. Yeah. And then we can all hang out together. Cool. Maybe they'll invite us over. Ooh. I really hope so. You know they have cool, like, cocktails and things. For sure. In their basement speakeasy. They got the cocktail with, like, the fog on top. Yeah. Like, smoke. They have, like, all homemade syrups and tinctures. Mm -hmm. It's it's mm -hmm. cool. We want to hang out, hang out with them. They sound fun. And finally, before we begin, uh, I must say that this is a sensitive topic. So some things to remember as we move through the story are that um, some of the terms that are used mostly in quotations are dated. We're not going to use any slurs or swear words unless it's in a quotation again. But if you hear a word or phrase that is not inclusive enough by today's standards, please remember that we are referencing antiquated documents and beliefs and conversations and laws. The terminology that we are comfortable with right now did not exist back then. So a lot of times, a good example will be like the umbrella term that is used is gay. Mm -hmm. Everybody is gay, whether you're trans, whether you're a lesbian, whether you're whatever part of the rainbow you are. In this time, in this way, they refer to almost everyone as gay. So while we know that there is more diversity than that, sometimes that word is used as more of an umbrella than we would like it. Mm -hmm. So just want to let you guys know that it's not coming from us. It is coming from historical documents. Got it. Yeah. Uh, oh, and the last thing in the sensitive topic domain. So the Stonewall Uprising is usually, usually referred to as an uprising or a rebellion now. But historically, it's referred to as a riot or a series of riots. And there's a lot of contention around using that word. Some people think that word is exactly the word that should be used because it was people fighting in the streets. And some people think that it was a word conditioned into the population by police who wanted it to look more violent than it was. Mm -hmm. There are compelling arguments on both sides. So we'll just use any and all language and, uh, and know that we are, we are thinking of one and all. Great. And if you're going to talk about it, just be conscious of how you do so. All right, then. Leslie, do you have anything in the way of announcements to add before we begin? Not one. I got them all. I got two. Just you got, kidding. Oh, no, I don't, what if you I did? Don't, I don't know. What if I did? That'd been great. <laughs> I would be really impressed. All right, then. But, but no, nothing. <laughs> On with the show. On Saturday, June 27th, 1969, Greenwich Village was a hot place to be. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it still is a hot place sure. to be. And I don't mean metaphorically, though. It was, you know, it was pretty awesome. I mean, it was hot, like literally hot. And this is Greenwich Village, New York? Yes. Is there another Greenwich Village? I don't know. People are from the UK. They don't know. I guess it's or a neighborhood in Manhattan. So yeah. we just have been lucky enough to live around it. I guess we have. And Greenwich Village is like a center for cultural mm -hmm. stuff and a lot of um a lot of LGBTQ plus stuff happens in the village and specifically on Christopher Street. It's been like kind of a hub for that mm -hmm. community for a long time. Anyway, a heat wave had hit the city sending temperatures north of 95 degrees in the shade. It was a dense humid heat. This is the East Coast. It is not a nice heat ever. Mm -mm. We just get a wall of like walking through wet napkins. It's a nightmare. Yeah. Um, it's the kind of heat that leaves you permanently agitated. You're just always uncomfortable yeah. and like sticky. And it lingered in the air well past sunset. You know, those days where you're like, oh, it'll be better once the sun goes down. And then it's no. not. Yeah. <sighs> That's what we're headed towards right now. I have a feeling it yeah, is. Yeah. This week. <laughs> it's just gross. <laughs> The Stonewall Inn, located at 51 and 53 Christopher Street, which sounds confusing, but really it's just kind of like a duplex of mm -hmm. buildings, 
uh, was busy that night. But that was nothing new. At a time when serving an openly gay person could get you both arrested, the Stonewall Inn, with its shabby stools and tired old jukebox, was the city's premier gay bar. Yeah. The Stonewall Inn catered entirely to the LGBTQ plus population. And I mean the whole rainbow. They got it. They understood it wasn't just gay. Everyone from homeless teens to celebrated artists made their way to the Stonewall. But calling it an inn was kind of a, a generous term by that point. The sign may have indicated it was a restaurant, sort of, but there was no food. There was a bar, like like a structure of the bar was mm-hmm. there, right? Uh, but they didn't have a liquor license and they didn't have running water behind the bar. Ooh. So they would just have big tubs of murky water. They would just rinse a glass in and hand it back to you. Oh my gosh. Which makes me want to throw up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine seeing that? I'd be like, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> uh-uh. It was a different time then, Holly. <laughs> it was. And to be fair, we'll go into this later. It was technically a bottle club, so you could bring your own. Okay. I would be like, I do not need your class. <laughs> yeah. I'm good, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. I brought my own. <laughs> the manager was an ex-convict everyone called Skull. Like a big guy Skull was. And he would pace the bar silently, keeping a watchful eye or like a really creepy eye on the <laughs> customers. He just kind of like skulked around, staring. <laughs> appropriate. The toilets were always overflowing and never maintained. Also, I could not handle that. The windows had all been blacked out except for one in the bathroom, I believe. And what little bit of light there was, was very, very dim. It was filthy, smoky, and perpetually damp. Just, I can't handle that either. Oh. We've talked about this before. And either you or I can handle things that are just sticky. No, for no, for no oh. reason. It's just a jam jar. It's just sticky. Just, uh, I have to wipe my daughter's hands like several times a day. I can't yeah. handle it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all of these gross things, right? And yet there was always a crowd. Mm. In fact, it would be strange if there wasn't a crowd at this place. But that night, something was off. A restless feeling hung in the air. Maybe it was just the heat. Maybe just some gas. Maybe. Maybe your stomach was turning a little bit from all that weird liquid sloshing around. The smell of the urinals and overflowing. I imagine it smelled like nightmares in there. Yeah. Because it was a lot of people in a very, it's small. It's Mm -hmm. like a small little bar. Like if you've been to old bars, any old bar in a city that's like got that old pub style to it, it looks sort of like a hunting lodge. It's like a shotgun. It's just straight back. Mm-hmm. The Stonewall had rooms in the back as well, but they were contained closed rooms. They weren't mm-hmm. like a big open space. It had a little dance floor, but that was it. And it would shove like hundreds of people into this tiny little space right. where there was no running water behind the bar, really questionable toilets and just substances. And everybody <laughs> went there to like... It's substances. <laughs> just like, yeah. You know, just be people. Yeah. <laughs> Oof, it's a lot. It's like... Candyland or something. Oh, man. Yeah. I can't imagine it smelled good. Anyway, by 1.20 a.m. on the 28th of June, 1969, there were around 200 patrons packing this small bar. Okay. A lot of people. Some were regulars and some were brand new, but all of them were stunned when suddenly the main lights flipped on. So the big, like, ka-chunk, big main lights. The music stopped. The doors closed and four plainclothes officers in dark suits, along with two uniformed patrol officers, shouted, Police! We're taking the place! Everyone get in line and have your ID ready! Oh. It was a raid. Normally, those six cops and the paddy wagon that was on its way would have been all they needed to handle the situation. Generally, anyone caught in these raids were kind of resigned to their fate. And once you were caught, you lowered your head, did what you were told, and prayed not to be locked up for too long. One could only hope that nobody saw you being carted away, though, because that was, Mm -hmm. you didn't want people to know where you were or what you were doing. But not that night. Much like the ants slowly realized they outnumbered the grasshoppers, the patrons of the Stonewall Inn looked around at their numbers, thought about all the horrible things they had been put through in the past, and dug in their heels. Enough was enough. What started as a refusal to go quietly quickly escalated into an all-out uprising involving hundreds and hundreds, and at some points, thousands of people. Wow. One woman described in the newspaper as, quote, a typical New York dyke. 
not language I would use. And I'm assuming this is uh, some level of like masculine presenting woman. Mm-hmm. Who knows at that time, it could have just been a woman with a shorter haircut um, and a lesbian. She had been taken away from the bar in handcuffs and they brought her out to the front to wait for the paddy wagon because that's the thing they had to wait, which is wild. We'll get into that later. And she tried, she kept trying to escape. They would like bring her out to the front lawn and she would just walk away. There, She's not tethered to anything. She's like, okay, I guess I'm going to go. Yeah. And then they would grab her and bring her back. And this happened like three times before she started fighting with the officers. And she told them that her handcuffs were too tight, which the police responded to by taking out their uh, batons and hitting her over the head. Yep. That's yeah, a good that's response. A, that's a really good response, right? After this, she looked out into the crowd, blood running down her face. And in desperation, shouted, why don't you guys do something? And this time they did. Molotov cocktails flew, nightsticks were drawn, and a throng of angry, frustrated, persecuted inhabitants of the West Village fought back for the first time with everything they had. A three-day uprising had begun. There were fires, destruction, violence, a scraping, clawing, biting, spitting, fight against oppression, and kick lines. Ooh, yes. Yeah, this is a good uprising, let me tell you. <laughs> But let's pause here for a moment because there has to be more than that. How did we get there? Being gay couldn't have always been this violently illegal, could it? Uh, yes and no, I'm going to say. say. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess it could. The thing is that people just didn't pay this much attention to it. Yeah. It was something that was really not, they didn't talk about it and therefore didn't really as heavily prosecute it. Now, I'm going to go in slightly to the McCarthyism of it all, but know that this is just the surface of all of it. Like there is clearly way more that happened. There is way more. Uh, there's just more. <laughs> I'm doing what I can. But to begin, the history of criminalized homosexuality is long, spotty, and sordid. Interestingly enough, it also has almost nothing to do with actual homosexuals. Right. What a surprise. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what? <laughs> I thought it was just about that. <laughs> no. In America, criminalized homosexuality goes all the way back to before the states were united. If you can recall, the colonies uh, were colonized in the name of puritanical values, and that was wrapped up in a bow of religious freedom to make the whole thing easier for our modern tiny little brains to digest. Correct. Don't you remember in school when you're being taught like basically Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. they're like, the pilgrims came over because they were tired of so many restrictions. Yeah. All they wanted was to be free. Mm -hmm. That's not, <laughs> that's not describing it very well. No. I have to say, we no. were sold a false bill of goods. Yeah. I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I was taught the history, when I was taught the history of America, the greatest, richest, smartest, and most godliest nation under the sun, that's the angle that was presented. They said the Church of England didn't like their like wanting, the Puritans wanting freedom. And so they left to create their own church. The books, however, didn't go on to clarify that these pilgrims, as we call them only on Thanksgiving, right, wanted uh, to adhere to incredibly strict and austere religious rules because yeah. the Church of England and the Catholics were too chill. Right. Yeah. They were too relaxed. Yeah. The Catholics were too relaxed. Yeah. What? So because I went to a Catholic school. Yeah. This was kind of, I would say, the later half of grade school, like maybe seventh, eighth grade. Sure. That's when we all started to kind of understand like, oh, the Puritans were prude. Like that was like yeah. how we would always like describe it. Mm -hmm. and And it was because... Being at the Catholic school, we're like, they're stricter than this. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a funny yeah. point of reference. But yeah, it's true. <laughs> so what? I always thought they were like, we just want freedom for yeah. everyone. But that's not what they wanted. They just wanted more rules. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to be free. We want to be stricter. Yeah. We want the freedom to be not free. Exactly. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> You're doing it wrong. <laughs> oh, my God. And so basically what we would call them now is religious extremists, mm -hmm. right? And they wanted their own colony. And, and, and if all of that happened right now, we would recognize it for what it will, was. That's a cult. You're a cult. You want your religion to be stricter and more confined. And you want to take everyone away from everyone they know and move them across the world to start a new church wherein they repopulate the area. That is a cult. Yeah. That is Jonestown. I know, but <laughs> like, yeah, but I don't know that anybody would. Say, I mean, yeah, I think you and I would still say that, yeah. but it's still wrapped up in religion. 
like just, an actual yeah. religion. You know what I mean? So I just think it's funny like that we be... have those religions now. Yeah. Like I know people part of religions that are this <laughs> and yeah. then they're just fine and walking among us. And but if they, they go said, to I'm going to move into the jungles of a foreign country that is uninhabited so that we can practice our religion in a stricter way, isolated from the rest of the world. You'd be like, you have Good. joined a cult. <laughs> Also that. <laughs> Good. Good. Go back to your cult. Yes. And take all the snakes with you. Oh, Thank no. You. That's... <laughs> Goodbye. Poor Leslie. She's still traumatized. <laughs> um, I, I just think it's funny that if we just remove this situation and put it into a modern setting, yeah. it would be totally different. Yeah. Um, but because America really only held on to the freedom bit of their original mission mm-hmm. statement, as time went on, other colonies were formed for different reasons. So the Puritans were just one group of people that colonized America. There were also people that wanted to make fucking money. But strict Christian values did maintain their position of power. Because like any good cult, early Americans knew that the best way to cement their stronghold and push out the indigenous Americans, who they completely did not expect to want to keep their land. What a twist. Wow. They thought yeah. they were going to be like, oh, we love you. We'll be your slaves. Goodbye. Sure. And that's not what they did. So weird. Weird, right? Yeah. Oh, God. Anyway. thought they'd be agreeable. Uh, didn't we all? Yeah. But because they weren't, our colonists here think, oh, the best way to, like, cement our dominance is to increase our numbers. Mm-hmm. Bump up the population. Have as many children as humanly possible. And if we yeah. look at our religion, we can, tr- like, totally make it so that, like, you have to. Yeah. It's all about population increase and being I the know. dominant race of people. That's yeah. what it is. Luckily, Christians have been doing this for centuries. They have been. Yeah, I was going to say, this is like a joke amongst our friends. Oh, too. Lord. Like, like they're having so many children. Always. They still are, <laughs> man. Know. So the colonies had a pretty good model to build on, and clearly it has stuck around. Yeah. The quiverful movement of people are the same thing. It's like, have as many kids as you can so that our specific flavor of Christianity dominates. Yeah. So here's a here's part of our sodomy laws history. Okay, documented, quote, documented executions for sodomy began in 1624 in the colonies with Richard Cornish. I don't know what Richard Cornish did. We'll call him Dick Cornish. Ooh, nice. Mm -hmm. A member of the Virginia colony, influenced by Puritan beliefs and values, the Massachusetts Bay General Court was the first to officially outlaw sodomy in 1631. Now, these are the witch trials people, too, so they were Mm -hmm. really looking for anybody they could Mm kill. Mm -hmm. The first documented conviction for lesbian behavior in America took place in 1649, and in 1714, sodomy laws were established across the early colonies and in the colonial militia. Pretty early on, we had big opinions, right? Yeah. But those are just colonies. They're still under British law, right? Okay, okay, all right, I get it. If you want to get real American-y about it, like our true actual R history, let's talk about a man named Ensign Friedrich Gotthold Enslin. And we'll loop in some real big names just for good measure. Great. In February of 1778, the Major Aaron Burr, sir, yes, overheard a rumor. He was temporarily in charge of another ranking officer's regiment when he heard Ensign Anthony Maxwell saying he had caught Ensign Enslin in a compromising position with Private John Manhart. Oh, mm-hmm. The gossip mm-hmm. is hot. It really is. The tea is scalding. He said that Ensign Enslin was right about to engage in sodomy. <gasps> he was like going to put it in any second. Like, right. It was right there. Nathan. <laughs> he was talking about butt sex. Now, after this point in the documents, this guy is referred to as Lieutenant Enslin, but that is way less fun. So sure. I'm going to keep with the Ensign Enslin. I like that better. So this this rumor gets told to Aaron Burr, sir. And there are now two whole ass government funded trials based on this wild rumor. OK, the government's mm-hmm. like, right to the government. We will fix this. Yeah. First, Burr put that gossipy queen, Anthony Maxwell, on trial for talking shit, a.k.a. for slander. So we're pro Aaron Burr right now. He was like, okay. you can't be doing that. I'm going right. to court martial you for being a gossip. Yeah. Breach, it didn't go as well as we wanted to. Friedrich Enslin had, of course, denied anything had ever happened. He's like, I don't know what that guy's talking about. Nothing happened. Ooh, his word against. Exactly. But Anthony Maxwell then doubled back and said, well, I only said anything because I was really worried 
that a heinous crime was about to occur. Sure, yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Worried. And who do we think the court sided with? Mm, Yeah. (laughs) I wish. (laughs) Anthony Maxwell was acquitted, so the gossip won. Okay. And Friedrich Enslin was put on trial for attempted sodomy and perjury. Attempted sodomy, you say? Isn't that a weird way to phrase it? Yes, it is, so please remember it. Things did not go well for Ensign Enslin in court, obviously. He was convicted and sentenced to be discharged, but wait, there's more. As commander-in-chief, all military crime sentences were sent to none other than President Numero Uno, George Washington himself, for approval. And um, something I didn't know about General Washington was that he's kind of petty. Okay. George Washington... um. His report, which was documented by his secretary, said, quote, His Excellency, the Commander-in-Chief, approves the sentence and with abhorrence and detestation of such infamous crimes, orders Lieutenant Enslin to be drummed out of camp tomorrow morning. General Washington added the bit about the drums himself. The recommended sentence was just making him leave the army. Because adding to sentences was not the president's job. It was just to approve or disprove them. (laughs) But he was like, no, more. (laughs) Okay. And do you know what it means to be drummed out of the military? It sounds delightful. It is. Let me tell you. (laughs) It means the army got so mad they threw a parade. (laughs) Wow. And as we can agree. it's like the shame. (laughs) Kind of. But with like a lot of drums and fifes. So the whole like revolutionary war band you see at Colonial Williamsburg. They're escorting this guy from the service. Which, as I think we can all agree, is the least gay way to handle that. Yes. Absolutely. We hate how so, gay you are. Let's have a parade. So was that the first gay pride parade? <laughs> kind of. It kind of was. I mean, they really should still have drums and fifes if they wanted to yeah. make a statement. I would love that. Um, the diary of Lieutenant James McMichael records this being carried out. So he wrote down this whole event. You, yeah. you tell me how ungay you think it is. Okay. On March 15th, I this morning proceeded to the grand parade. Ooh. Already calling it a parade. Oh, in grand. <laughs> yeah, in a grand parade. <laughs> Where I was a spectator to the drumming out of Lieutenant Ens- Enslin of Colonel Malcolm's raiment. He was first drummed from right to left of the parade. So they first <laughs> went from right to left. Thence to the left wing of the army, from that to the center. So they had a whole formation they okay. did with him. And then lastly, transported over the Schuylkill in a boat. So then they brought their parade into the water with orders to never be seen in camp in the future. So they had, wait, why am I now, I'm now picturing Tobias uh, from, (laughs) what's his last name? Um, Fuque. Oh my God. Okay, from Arrested Development. Yeah, on that boat. (laughs) The first episode where he gets on that gay pride boat. Yeah. Yeah, probably not unlike that. And wait, they, they, there's a good conclusion to it, too. So they get him on. They cross the Schuylkill with him in a boat, still parading, drumming, fifing, calling, <laughs> fifing, the little whistles. Once they get him to the other side, they put him on dry land. They take off his coat. They turn it inside out. They put it on the wrong way. And then they leave. I was say they attempt to sodomize again. <laughs> no, they just change his outfit. Okay. So, like, you can't wear our cool coat. Yeah. And then they parade away. So then there was an outfit change? Yeah. Then there's a costume change. And they all leave back on their boat and parade back to their <laughs> encampment. Oh my goodness. Yes. Very, very ungay. That's a lot. <laughs> That's he must so have... Cute. And not only was that not ordered, it was what George Washington wanted. Right. He was like, you can't just kick him out. I want the parade. <laughs> Well, we we need to make this into a short film. <laughs> <laughs> the parading of Ensign Enslin. And then I wanted to end with Enslin walking away to the sound of um of uh Charlie Brown. Oh, like the no. sad like that or like, you yeah, had like a it bad just, day. Yeah, it just, it's like all chaotic yes. and then just real quiet. <laughs> it's the imagery of this is was so funny to me. I couldn't not include this story. I thought it was ridiculous. Now, of course, they said they did this because they wanted the person in question to be made a spectacle of. They wanted right. the public to see that they were putting him out of the army. And this way, um, he couldn't enlist ever again. Because okay. no, there's no like, 
we can't talk to people in other states back then. It was just you could talk to the person you could yell at or, or send right, a letter right. to, but they wouldn't Paul know. Paul Revere would have to go. Paul Revere, you'd have to be like, Paul Revere, I see that Ensign Ensign <laughs> is trying to join the army again. Get on your horse and ride. <laughs> and then there would be fireworks and a yeah. band. Yeah. Oh, my God. But then here's where the story gets really interesting. Ensign Enslin, uh, this all happened to him, the drama drama, because he was accused of attempted sodomy. Because sodomy literally meant anal penetration. Mm-hmm. So he was, a, he was accused of trying to get it in. Uh, and, and the penetration part, that's the only illegal thing that was on the table at that point. And since no one saw any of that happen, and since Aaron Burr already called out the original gossip for being a shady bitch, they had to flip-flop the case into a rape trial. Oh. That's what this turned into. Oh. So it is more sinister than you might think okay. at first. Attempted sodomy did not mean that Ensign Enslin was having a gay old time. It meant that he was trying to rape a fellow soldier, a soldier who stayed suspiciously quiet on the matter. Now, most people speculate this was due to the fact that the almost act in question was not rape. It was consensual. Mm -hmm. They were in the privacy of their own cabin doing their own thing. Um, And when the gossipy guy was called out, he was like, oh, no, I thought he was getting he was raping someone. And that's Mm -hmm. how that changed. Okay. Right. So, and the other guy absolutely didn't want to admit that that was what was happening. And it's a real shame he wasn't better at lying, this other guy, because if they just almost did some butt stuff, but didn't and nobody got hurt, then nothing illegal happened. He could have just said, oh, I have a weird mole I wanted my friend to look at. Sure. Or like, I got a bug bite or we, we were wrestling in the traditional Greco-Roman style. Sure. Any of that. Any, any literally any anything. There was a spot on his dick and then there was something in my ass and it just, it was quicker just not to pull up the pants. Yeah, we were doing an experiment for science. Sure. For military science. Anything. We were doing this, this thing. But he didn't do anything. He didn't say any of that. And incidentally, the Greeks and Romans were totally fine with gaying it up. And that's because they hadn't decided to radically misinterpret the Bible yet, which is where we're going next. I mean, for a while, there was no Bible. And even in its early days, they didn't really regard it as a collection of indisputable facts. We decided on that later. They thought it was a series of parables, but I digress. So eventually, sodomy laws came around as a device that was created to encourage rampant procreation, as near as I can tell. So they didn't want anybody doing it any other way besides a way that would lead to babies. Mm -hmm. So if they caught any word of that, they had to embarrass the shit out of you with drums and fifes. And throw you on the banks of the Schuylkill. It's so wild. Yeah. And the thing is, like, I, I'm willing to believe that the original intention was make people procreate. But those laws just, nobody got that part of it when it trickled into, like, state laws. They're just like, this is just a law. We just don't like this. Mm-hmm. So even the original intention got lost pretty quickly. So what actually is sodomy, legally speaking, because it still is against the law, right? Mm -hmm. There are actual sodomy laws that we do want to uphold. A lot of them at this point in time are, you know, sexual assault laws. And I'm so glad you asked because it's a term that has been interpreted to suit the whim of the court for centuries. So that it's the most loosely defined term I have ever encountered in my life, basically. And that's important to know because we're going to, sodomy laws play a major part in this. Traditionally, sodomy refers to, get ready to clutch your pearls, what was called as a crime against humanity. And that sounds, it's all so dramatic. It is, yeah. It sounds that way because what they meant is, you know, you are against humanity because you're not reproducing. That's what that means. It doesn't mean like against the whole of humanity. It's so evil. It means like this is something you're doing instead of making babies. Okay. And wait, you don't like babies? Why don't you want 100 babies or 500? Have a lot more babies. And they were like, I just want to have butt sex. <laughs> um, but it's better known, sodomy laws are better known as the sex stuff that is illegal. And it refers to anal sex, oral sex, digital penetration, penetration with a foreign object, penetration with a friend with a foreign <laughs> object, whatever you want, or any sexual activity between a human um, and an animal. At the time, bestiality was lumped in with all these laws mm-hmm. too. It also meant any non-procreative sexual activity. Now, this is a caveat that was added later, a.k.a. the gay stuff, because of reasons I just said. And it should, noted, it should be noted that when these things would occur between consenting members of opposite genders, nobody cared. Mm-hmm. They did not 
really care. Nowadays, we use it to refer to unwilling penetration. Unwilling is a very key word of any cavity with anything that isn't a penis. And also unwilling butt sex with a penis. It's all very vague because the source material is very big. Mm. But sodomy laws still do exist um, in a different way. So if you hear on like law and order that someone was accused of sodomy, it's usually because they're accused of uh, rape that includes like a penetration with a foreign object or something. Mm. That's how we refer to it now. Back then, not so much. Unsurprisingly, the root of the word sodomy and its subsequent prescribed definitions are biblical. Right. Obs, mm-hmm. so biblical. It is derived from the word sodomite, which means a resident of the city of Sodom. You might find yourself wondering at this point, so was Sodom just like a gay city then? Mm-hmm. A like super fun city where the drums and fights dropped you off? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is no. I mean, it wasn't not gay, but it wasn't just like, Super gay. And you can Catholic check me on all of this because I don't have the receipts. (laughs) I'm enjoying. Excellent. (laughs) Your your history. Yeah, this is this is told by someone who does not have a religious background, really. So I this is strictly academic. Yeah. Um, Because I just love when you find things so wild. I do. I I, I mean, I find them crazy. (laughs) It was described, correct me if I'm wrong, as a wicked city, a city where all Mm -hmm. like wicked things happened, everything hedonistic and amoral Mm -hmm. and anything that you could do that was like really fun happened Mm -hmm. there. And also like ugly and violent, but also fun. Mm -hmm. Um, Lots of shit went down there. The gay stuff is just, it seems to be the only thing that important Christians glom onto. Mm -hmm. They choose to remember that that shit went down and nothing else. Right, right, right. All right. Specifically, they usually reference the story of Lot. Mm-hmm. And you're going to really like this <laughs> because I'm going to tell you what happens in that story in my I was not raised with a lot right. of Christianity way. <laughs> so here's here's the breakdown by, by a person who doesn't know religion. God tells Abraham that Sodom is full of awful people who have gotten out of control. So he's like going to plan a hard reset, right? He's like, we got to we gotta wipe that shit out. All done. I don't like them. And Abraham asks, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Meaning, does everyone have to die, even the good ones? And God goes... <laughs> There are no good ones. Yeah. (laughs) So far, so good? Okay, good. But Abraham, whose nephew Lot and his family live in Sodom, thinks this is maybe like a little extreme. But God likes extreme. He sure does. Though he isn't opposed to like a little compromise. Mm -hmm. And so the two strike a bargain. If Abraham can find just 10 people in Sodom, it was originally 50, but Abraham like argued him down. (laughs) (laughs) Good at like... (laughs) controlling that situation. If he finds 10, God won't control alt delete the entire place into oblivion. But this proves to be way harder than Abraham expected because they are all doing some wicked shit down there. <laughs> so God's like, mm, told you so, we got to wipe this place out. But you know what? I think Lot and his family are pretty cool. So you know what? I will just spare them for you, my friend, Abraham. And maybe that's all Abraham was worried about in the first place. I don't know. Probably. This could be a win-win. Yeah. It's fine. God then sends two angels to destroy the city of Sodom. But it's like a long trip. So when they get there, they're very tired. And God's like, okay, when you get to Lot's house, just Lot, you can stay there for the night, tell them the plan, chill out. Next morning, everything burns. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But you got to get them out first. Um, And the angels are like, okay, cool. They get to Lot's house and Lot is so nice. They really like him. He has a nice wife and a couple of nice daughters and they're super welcoming and cool. But within minutes, the super uncool men of the city, both young and old, surround Lot's house because apparently they can smell, they can smell visitors, male visitors, which are their favorite kind. (laughs) So they just (laughs) form a circle around the house and they demand, and I imagine the creepiest way possible, that Lot send these visitors out so that they can fuck them, which some would argue is the warmest welcome. Sure. (laughs) Right? You got a couple of angels there. Who wouldn't want to fuck up? Yeah, (laughs) exactly. But Lot does not think this. And honestly, like, not these creeps. They're so (laughs) rapey. So Lot says, no, 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 no. Leave those guys alone. I'll give you my two virgin daughters instead. And you can do whatever you want with them. There you go. And then we totally skip over how fucked up that is. And the men reply, no deal. We want those guys. Oh, my God. I, Yeah. (laughs) Lot still says no, and so the men decide he's way too uppity and has no right to judge them. Then they threaten to do worse to him than they were going to do to the visitors. So, like, I guess, I don't know, have worse 
more prolonged unwanted sex with all of them at once or something. I don't know. At this point, the angels decide that enough is enough. And so they just blind all the men and go back inside. They're like, mm-hmm. everybody shut up, blind. Right. <sighs> once they get inside, the angels... Which is also, I feel like they make them blind by like shining, like by like lighting up. Oh, okay. I like that. So, a very <laughs> bright light. Yeah. So again, a very gay thing to do. Look at yourselves. <laughs> uh, stop it. I could be wrong. That could be like a movie thing. I don't know. It makes them all sparkle and that's vampires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, that's, where, that's where she got it from. Yep, there it is. Actually, we found it. So. <laughs> so once they're back inside, the angels are like, Lot, that was rough. You have to leave right now. We really have to wipe this place out. I think that this proves it's a total teardown. And Lot says, no, 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 no. I have to tell a few more people. And they're very annoyed by this. Eventually, the next morning, the angels... is like awful. These two men are about to be raped. He offers up his daughter. Yeah, he's not great. Like, if anybody should be blinded, it's him. It's Lot. I don't know why God was like, we will definitely save Lot. He is great. Abraham is like his guy. And his main guy. (laughs) And he wants him saved. But like, I I think this proves that was a bad choice. But anyway, (laughs) so... Eventually, the next morning, the angels just grab the Lots by the hand and run them out of the city. They're like, let's go. Uh, well, most of them. Lot's wife, who doesn't get a name in the Christian version of this story, um, the Jewish version gives her a name, gives her a couple names, but not the Christians. Typical. So she looks over her shoulder to see the destruction of her city, you know, everything that she has known. And God sees her do this, and it makes him irrationally angry. So he turns her into a pillar of salt. It's a choice, I guess. Sure. I guess Oasis was right. Yeah. Don't look back in anger. (laughs) I heard you say. (laughs) Now, the takeaway there apparently was, if you are a dude who has sex with other dudes, you deserve to be blinded and burned alive by God fire. It's not not my takeaway. You mean the takeaway wasn't that if you demand to rape people's guests and then threaten them with violent sexual torture, you deserve to be blinded and burned alive by Godfire. Nope, we're going to focus on the fact that they wanted the grown men and turned down the little girls because that's crazy. <sighs> this just proves that the Bible is merely a series of stories meant to teach something. But what that something is, is up to your interpretation. Don't even get me started on Locke's wife. Oh, what a story. Then, in the worst epilogue ever, Lot and his daughters escape the burning city and bid and bid a fond farewell to their salty, nameless matriarch. But what do they do now? Take to the hills, of course. Hill people have never made bad choices, have they? Not one. Not one time. Let's find out what they do. <laughs> Lot hides in the hills with his daughter, and then he takes a nap because what a big day they've had. Big day. But the little lots are concerned. And not for any reason you might guess. Not for any good or helpful reasons. With their mother gone, they're upset because there's no hope now of their dad getting a male heir. Because I guess there are no other women that exist in the world anywhere, except there are. But their solution is they'll get lot drunk and then have sex with him one at a time so they can both have incest babies and preserve the family line. So... Yeah, the Bible is cool, and we should definitely listen to all of its opinions on sex. Mm. Anyway, here's Wonderwall. Mm. It's just so much, so much stuff. It's so weird. Yep, Ugh. yep, yep, yep. The Bible is definitely a recurring character in the homophobic galaxy of stars, but usually you'll hear people weakly leaning on the words of the book of Leviticus. And that's interesting, considering the story we just heard, for a lot of reasons. But mostly because, remember when I said said this shit was misinterpreted? Well, it turns out the book of Leviticus was quite literally poorly translated. And so your theory that Lot is the worst of them all does hold up! Great. (laughs) Yes, you're going to be right in the end. We love it. So to better explain this phenomenon, we're going to turn to an essay Um, that I found online, a phenomenal and well-sourced essay that's written by an anonymous student. So I will include the link in the show notes this week if you want to read it in its entirety. But for now, here are some quotations. Quote, no matter how we read the Hebrew Bible, we must remember that we are not reading it in the original Hebrew language. Every Bible we read is translated from the original. 
And what that means for us, since we're English speakers, is that it's probably been filtered through a few other languages before it landed on the English translation. Mm-hmm. It started in Hebrew and then it went to, you know, Greek or Italian or whatever before filtering through another one and then hitting English. Mm-hmm. So we're really not getting the words as they were originally intended. And if you know anything about things getting lost in translation, the meaning can get a little muddy. Translations of Leviticus 18.22 into English fluctuate. The King James Version translates the verse as, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Mm. We've all heard that one before. Right. Mm -hmm. The NIV offers, Do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is detestable. Mm -hmm. Little judge here. Sure. Little judge here. The NRSV 1989 states, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Yeah. Combination. A little, little angrier. The priest for equality translation makes, who doesn't seem to like equality mm-hmm. at all, makes a bold move with its translation. Do not lie with a person of the same sex in the same way you would lie with a person of the opposite sex. It is detestable. Wordy. A wordy choice. Uh, interestingly, translators for the priest of equality determined to not only forbid male same-sex relations, but to blanket the statement to all same-sex relations. If you're going real strict on the Leviticus gay train, they only talk about man-on-man action. Mm -hmm. They don't, but we're going to get there. Leave women to their hobbies. Leave them alone! (laughs) (laughs) The Expositor's Bible Commentary reviews several interpretations, and thank God this person read it, not me. (laughs) But most of its attention is to Jacob Milgram's work on Leviticus. Milgram finds that the word used for male and female words in the verse features a singular version for the male and a plural word for female. Milgram shows that the phrase translated as one lies with a woman is only found here and in Leviticus 2013. The phrase as one lies with occurs five times in the Hebrew Bible. As one lies with occurs four times where it references bed and does not indicate a sexual act. Genesis 49.4 designates a sexual act when Reuben sleeps with his father's wife. Thus, Milgram maintains that the phrase, as one lies with, should be understood as a place, Mm -hmm. not an activity. Talking about the actual physical bed. So let's try another scholar. What do they have to say? K. Renato Ling's understanding of Leviticus 18.22 gives us a better idea about the meaning of the original Hebrew. Ling's thus maintains that in the English text should be translated on the basis of Hebrew linguistics. And that's what we talked about before, not filtered through some other languages. He builds on the, and, and you know, the way that the Hebrew language is structured differently than English. So we cannot really be as direct as we might want to be. He builds on the work of David Stewart and the idea that this passage is really about male-on-male incest, which is where we get closer to the whole lot situation. Mm -hmm. First, Lings notes that the word used for man is not the typical noun used for man. Instead, a word which translates to male occurs here. This noun for male includes both young and adult males. Therefore, Lings translates the text of Leviticus 18.22 as, and with a male you shall not lie. A little fancier, Mm a little more fun. Probably easier to rhyme, which we all like. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Now that Lings has solved the linguistic problem with man and male, the first half of the verse is pretty straightforward. However, difficulties with translation start as one turns to the next phrase, as with a woman. Lings contends that the translators have taken liberties here by including the word as. Many translations also include particles like with or like, according to Ling. These words are not part of the original Hebrew text. Thus, he translates the verse so far as to mean, and with a bell you shall not lie down the lyings of a woman. I wanted the second half to rhyme a lot better. Sure. I don't understand. Well, let me help you. <laughs> Thank you. Lings moves his work to the Hebrew word for lyings. So that's a different word. And we know that in the original Hebrew, the word was lyings. This word appears in plural, which Milgram missed. The singular version of the Hebrew word is used frequently. According to Ling, the reference in Genesis 49.4 depicts lyings as incest. Mm. So the translation is different. If we take that into account, we discover then the text refers to the forbidden act of incest, which actually makes a lot of sense in reference to the rest of Leviticus, which is basically a long diatribe about please don't fuck your relatives. Right. Finally, Ling discusses the noun for women. Why the word used for male is clearly referenced elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible for all ages. (laughs) Typical. 
The one used for women refers to an adult woman. In fact, many times the word is translated as wife in English. It is important to note that the Hebrew presents an adult woman only, but uses a non-specific noun for the male. The text can be talking about a young boy or a grown man, but woman is clearly a grown woman. Furthermore, Lings considers the context in which Leviticus 18.22 is written. He explains that the passage deals with various illicit relationships in the sexual realm. One would be marrying two sisters, intercourse with menstruating women, infidelity, and bestiality. Most of Leviticus 18 deals directly, however, with incest. In Leviticus 18, the order of the topics is ambiguous, but in chapter 20, the so-called homosexual law appears within a list referring to incest, and I've read the list. It is Don't lie with your mom. Don't lie with your mom's mom. Don't lie with your mom's sister. Don't lie with your mom's dad. Don't lie with your dad's. It's just a list of don't fuck your family. Right. And then it's like, and don't lie with males like women's or whatever the phrase is that we have boiled it down to. So um, Ling's linguistic study leads him to conclude that Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13 continue the theme of incestuous relationships. Thus, the passage should be paraphrased Sexual intercourse with a close male relative should be just as abominable to you as incestuous relationships with female relatives. So what they really mean is don't fuck your male family either. Mm -hmm. So Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13 forbids male incestuous relations, not homosexuality. Eat it, Christian weirdos. You're doing it wrong. And Lot, fucking stop, man. Just... You you broke the actual rule. Well, he was drunk. His his daughters got him drunk. Then they broke the rule. Yeah. Anyway, there's rule there's Leviticus breaking. And that's why I mean, but also that I think proves your point or this article's point correctly because they had to get their dad drunk in order to do it because they knew it was wrong. Yeah, they like forced it on him. Yeah. Which then would make the sodomy rape and not just Yeah. So like, we're right, okay? We are right. And how they have distilled this into don't be gay is kind of mind-blowing. That's what I'm getting, that's what I'm getting to. (laughs) Pretty interesting stuff though, right? Sure. I think it is. Yeah. But outlawing incest with such ferocity probably would have only adversely affected like royal families, you know? Yeah. And um, they're the ones that make the laws (laughs) and fund the church. So we're just, don't be gay. Yeah, you do the math on that one. I think it's pretty obvious. But America never had a royal family and we don't really do the whole bloodline breeding thing to, at at least in the public, uh, people could be doing it in their own ways. I have no idea. Um, So what's our problem? Well, aside from the fact that we inherited our laws mostly from England, obviously, and despite the petty actions of Revolutionary War veterans in power who loved a parade, Mm -hmm. loved it. For a while, we didn't really have a problem with gaiety per se, as long as you didn't talk about it. Quote, early American sodomy laws seem to have not been enforced against consenting adults acting in private. So like if you were both consenting and you were in the privacy of your own home, nobody was looking to arrest you for them. Mm -hmm. Instead, sodomy sodomy prosecution often involved predatory acts against those who could not or did not consent. Relations between men and minor girls. Don't Come on, lot. <laughs> Let's go. Or minor boys between adults involving force, which is rape, between adults implicating disparity in status, which means somebody using power to exact sex upon another, or between men and animals. And we can agree all of those things are pretty bad. So that's how they used sodomy laws for a very long time. It's kind of exactly how we use them now. Right. Quote, Colin Talley argues that sodomy statutes in colonial America in the 17th century were largely unenforced. The reason he argues is that all male eroticism did not threaten the social structure or challenge the gender division of labor or the patriarchal ownership of wealth. So basically, we didn't care because men could just keep their power and money and it didn't affect us, them at all. Yeah. They don't like lesbians probably. No. But men on men, hot man on man action was fine. Yes. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and it's true. It, that whole statement is true. It's unfair, but it's true. The country wasn't exactly great to gay folks, but they weren't bothered by them on a national level. And things stayed like this for a really long time. Now, remember, I said this is a pretty generalized version. There is a lot more. Yes, bad things happened in that interim. I am aware of them, but we do not have seven hours. 
According to Justice Anthony Kennedy, who authored the majority uh, opinion in Lawrence versus Texas, quote, American laws targeting same sex couples did not develop until the last third of the 20th century, which is interesting because same with abortion laws. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's not a coincidence, but that's another story for another time. So where did things take a huge turn? Like, how do we get to this, like, we're going to round up gay people in the street version of sodomy laws? The answer to that can be traced to right to, to right after World War II, which is super hypocritical, given the fact that we just uh, took up some real, shall we say, German methods of dealing with gay people. Mm. We didn't learn anything from that. We just decided to do it on our own. Great. Right. Okay. Why after World War II? Well, it seems that the big old whites in power got extremely uncomfortable with how loosey-goosey things became in their wartime absence. Remember, women went to work. The family structures became different with the father outside of the home. They were more powerful. Everybody that wasn't the patriarch of the family was more powerful. And so they decided what we really needed in America was the return to traditional family values, or as they put it back then, to restore the pre-war social order and hold off the forces of change. Does this sound familiar? It really, really should. It does. It sure does. I wonder where it got from. Oh, mm. I'm going to mm. lay it out for you. <laughs> um, but before you do, this just reminds me of some, uh, like kind of a quote that I just sure. heard um, or an idea that was when men are with women, like when a, well, when a man meets a woman, mm -hmm their life becomes easier. Mm -hmm. But when a woman meets a man, her life becomes harder. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you have it. They were like, how do we keep that going? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so angry straight white men were doing okay on their own. They usually do. But they really needed something else. What they really needed was a paranoid, borderline culty leader to whip them into a next level lather. Someone to tell them that they were right and everyone else was out to get them. This mm -hmm. should also sound very familiar. Mm -hmm. How about Senator Joseph McCarthy? Oh, he sounds great. Yeah, the communist blacklist guy? Yes. Yeah, that guy. He'll do nicely. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. The more conservative politicians in the United States had pretty much always referred to progressive reforms things like child labor laws, women's suffrage, anything like that that's making a positive change in the world, they refer to them as communist mm -hmm. or red plots. And they tried to get people afraid of such changes by saying that they were the communists were in charge of them, basically. Yeah. And so every time change rears its ugly head, it's time to start getting really scared of the communists again. Now, boogeymen are all well and good, but these people were appealing to adults and not children, which meant they had to have receipts. They had to produce some real life examples. So labeling any conduit of change a communist made it really easy to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And Senator McCarthy from the jump came with a whole list. One that would homogenize all the people the powers that be would rather keep in the shadows. And can you guess what color it was? Mm. It was it was black. It was the black list. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. What's funny about Senator McCarthy, uh, most things are not, but this I found kind of amusing, is that he like burst onto the blacklisting scene and he was like, hello, I have a list of 200 communists living in the United States. 200? You already have 200? Where did you get them from? And everyone was like, who are they? Let's get them. Right? <laughs> are you kidding? Okay. According to Senator McCarthy, quote, anarchists, communists, and other people deemed un-American and subversive were considered security risks. Gay men and lesbians were included in this list by the U.S. State Department on the theory that, wait for it, they were susceptible to blackmail. Mm. It's real. We're going to really stretch, stretch it thin right now. In 1950, a Senate investigation chaired by Clyde R. Huey, what a fun last name that is. Huey. Huey! noted in a report that, quote, it is generally believed that those who engage in overt acts of perversion lack the emotional stability of a normal person. Hence, they'd be fired. They would just go right in for blackmail. And said that all the government's intelligence agencies are, quote, in complete agreement that sex perverts and government constitute security risk. And that's true, but their definition of sex perverts is not the same as ours. On April 19th, 1950, the Republic... my birthday. Yes, it is. 
The Republican national chairman, Guy George Gabrielson, said that, quote, sexual perverts who have infiltrated our government in recent years were perhaps as dangerous as the actual communists. Oh, Guy George said this? Yeah, he did. And then McCarthy was like, but they are communists. We're calling them all. Come on, let's get it together. Everyone is a communist. So Senator McCarthy hires Roy Cohn as chief cast counsel of his congressional subcommittee. Together, McCarthy and Cohn, with the enthusiastic support of the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, were responsible for the firing of scores of gay men and women from government employment and strong-armed many of their opponents into silence using rumors, most of them fabricated, perhaps some of them true, of their homosexuality. Mm. So they weaponized the threat of exposing someone as a homosexual for their own gain. And here's the fun part about that. Roy Cohn, the man who mentored Donald Trump, Mm. Donald Trump learned everything he knows directly from Roy Cohn. Remember this, because this is still happening very much. Mm -hmm. The same thing is very much still happening. Um, He called Trump his best friend. And when he died, the only thing that wasn't seized by the FBI that he was allowed to like keep in his estate was a pair of knockoff diamond cufflinks that Trump had given him. That's how much he loved Donald Trump. Anyway, uh, Roy Cohn, also known as virulently anti-gay, was in reality a closeted gay man. I like that name better. (laughs) Virulently anti-gay? Yeah. (laughs) Also known as. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Call him that. Yeah. Roy had an affair with a high-ranking member of the Catholic Church. Okay. Of course. The Pope? No, he's a cardinal. Oh. High enough. Among numerous other men, he had affairs with lots of men all while spending his entire career campaigning ferociously to rid the country of homosexuals, especially things like he he wanted to get homosexual teachers out of schools. Like he just, Mm -hmm. I mean, the lengths that he went to to strip anybody with any kind of homosexuality of everything they held dear was extensive. Appropriately enough, he died of AIDS in 1986 at 59 years old. His last known boyfriend, because people knew he had boyfriends, he lived with them and stuff, was a man named Peter Frazier, who was 30 years his junior. The AIDS memorial quilt describes him as Roy Cohn, bully, coward, victim. Wow. Yeah, it's powerful. We can expect 30 minutes on Roy Cohn from me in the future. He is an interesting case study. Hmm. But wait, there's more. Oh. Because of course there is. J. Edgar Hoover was also a known closeted homosexual. No. I know, right? And was rumored to enjoy dressing in women's clothing. That is mostly what we consider to be a rumor. But he did live with a man who received, like, the flag of his burial after his death. That's what your wife gets. This was clearly, like, his spouse. Wow. Yeah. I think, oh, yeah, I did know that. After his death, he was also discovered to have one of the largest pornography collections in United States history. Okay, well, that's something. Oh, yeah, look at you. Okay. Doing it big. And what about the big dog himself, Senator McCarthy? McCarthy's FBI file contains numerous allegations, including a 1952 letter from an army lieutenant who said, quote, when I was in Washington some time ago, Senator McCarthy picked me up at a bar in the Wardman Hotel and took me home. And while I was half drunk, he committed sodomy on me. Mm. There's that word again. He was also addicted to morphine. And I'll give you all 30 minutes on McCarthy, too, for good measure. Um, so, yeah, definitely got to get rid of those sex perverts in the government. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh. It's, so, it's so wild to me. I don't understand it. So many pots. So many kettles. Between 1947 and 1950, 1,700 federal job applications were denied. 4,380 people were distar- discharged from the military. And 420 were fired from their government jobs for being suspected homosexuals. It should be noted also that in 1952, the American Psychiatric Association listed homosexuality in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM as we know it, as a mental disorder. A large-scale study of homosexuality in 1962 was used to justify the inclusion of the disorder as a supposed pathological hidden fear of the opposite sex caused by a traumatic parent-child relationship. Homosexuality remained in the DSM until 1974. Mm -hmm. Always gets me at how late that was. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, the FBI and police kept lists of known homosexuals and their favorite establishments and friends because the blacklist just kept going. The U.S. Postal Service kept track of addresses where material pertaining to homosexuality was mailed. State and local governments followed suit. 
bars catering to gay men and lesbians were shut down and their customers were arrested and exposed in newspapers. Cities performed sweeps to rid neighborhoods, parks, bars, and beaches of gay people. They outlawed the wearing of opposite gender clothing and universities expelled instructors suspected of being homosexual. And all of this was filed under sodomy laws. Good old Senator Joey Mack was probably pretty familiar with sodomy laws, I'd wager, though he died in 1957 in disgrace as a consequence of his multiple addictions. People turned on the whole evil commie thing. They knew that was wrong. They knew he shouldn't have done it. They knew people actually died because of it. But uh, they kept all of the anti-gay stuff. So strange. Mm -hmm. Sodomy laws were at an all-time high in the early 60s, in fact. Mm. You seem confused. I am. Is it because sodomy was pretty clearly defined as an unwilling sex act and that these new stipulations are attacking just like a lot of people living their lives and doing their jobs? Yeah. Yeah, it's weird, right? Yeah. Well, remember all that Bible business we talked about? Yeah. Because it was so loosely and whimsically defined, the mere implication of possible sodomy became enough to warrant arrest, much like it did for Ensign Enslin. Mm. But this time it was on a grander scale. The focus veered away from the actual acts and onto the people who might theoretically commit some version of them based on nonviolent actions like handholding or dancing or dressing a certain way. And the definition suddenly dropped a lot of the unwilling and by force parts. Suddenly, we got real biblical. We weren't looking for sodomy anymore. We were looking for sodomites. And much like the fabled city, the righteous were being swept away with the wicked, so to speak. Hmm. Trying to prosecute suspected criminals before they've committed a crime has never gone very well. But we still do it. Why do you think some people assume that if a drag queen reads their kids a story, they're going to either rape those kids as soon as the last page is turned or try to get them into a legion of future rapists. This, this is why. This is exactly why. It's not a concept drawn from their own ideas. It's something that has been ingrained since 1630 mm -hmm. in American history. Yeah. And ingrained incorrectly, because as we have discussed, it's all based on wrong translations of certain laws and, and parables. Very interesting. Yeah, very. To be fair, this nonsense did not go completely unbalanced. Quote, in response to this trend, two or this is a wiki roundup on this, two organizations formed independently of each other to advance the cause of gay men and lesbians and provide opportunities where they could socialize without fear of being arrested. So they were forming their own groups. Los Angeles area homosexuals created the Matachine Society, which is a fun name, in 1950, and in the home of communist activist Harry Hay, which surely didn't help the whole blacklist thing associating with known communists, but uh, that's neither here nor there. New York and Washington, D.C. opened their own chapters of the Medicine Society, and soon after, several women in San Francisco met in their living room to form the Daughters of Belitis for lesbians. Mm -hmm. So they had their own clubs, and fuck all y'all. <laughs> as helpful as they were, the society's forms simply weren't widespread enough. You have like these little places to meet, but they weren't everywhere. Mm -hmm. The police had begun to hunt down the city's LGBTQ plus population during calculated raids. Raids? I hear some of you thinking, what do you mean raids? Oh, yes, this is the part of the history that often gets skipped over. As we have discussed, for a while, being gay or trans was illegal in the United States, but entrapment wasn't. Quote, in the early 1960s, a campaign to rid New York City of gay bars was in full effect by order of Mayor Robert F. Wagner Jr., who was concerned about the image of the city in preparation for the 1964 World's Fair. He said, oh my goodness, everyone's coming to New York. We must get rid of the gays. The city revoked the liquor licenses of the bars and undercover police officers worked to entrap as many homosexual men as possible. Entrapment usually consisted of an undercover officer who found a man in a bar or a public place, engaged him in conversation, and if the conversation headed toward the possibility that they might leave together or the officer bought the man a drink, he was arrested for solicitation. Yeah, super fucked up, right? Yeah. Sidebar, this is why some people have a huge problem with Chris Hansen and the show To Catch a Predator. Entrapment has historically been extremely problematic. However, I think I can overlook it when it comes to someone saying they want to have sex with a 13-year-old and then showing up at their house with condoms and Zima. But that's the, that's the, um, that's the link when people are, are like, you know, To Catch a Predator is entrapment. It's just a slippery slope. That's why. Right, right. Okay. But I digress. 
Because the sodomy laws they were desperately clinging to were technically against a sex act, and it can be very hard to find someone actively proving their gayness, there were also little laws put into place to make exacting punishment easier. For example, the New York State Liquor Authority, often referred to as the NYSLA, regarded any LGBT person in a bar as engaging in disorderly conduct. So if you were in a bar having a gay old time, mm-hmm. uh, put, put your arm around a member of the same sex, or you just look, looked like you were on a date, that was disorderly conduct, which is an arrestable offense. Right. And since it takes two to tango, whoever served them in that bar was guilty too. They were also disorderly mm-hmm. conducting themselves. Bars that were known to cater to gay clientele were mercilessly raided. People, police would drag away patrons in handcuffs and take liquor licenses on the spot. And this drove these businesses even further underground. But you know who isn't scared of the cops? Who? The mafia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A majority of whom were also represented in court by Roy Cohn. But that's besides the point, I'm sure. <laughs> There's no relation to the mafia, the Catholic Church, Roy Cohn, and all this shit, right? No, no, no. no. <laughs> What? No. (laughs) Even if there was, I wouldn't be saying that. (laughs) Exactly. Keep your mouth shut. (laughs) Don't say anything. (laughs) LGBTQ plus New Yorkers being pushed out of every establishment in the city looks like a travesty to most of us, right? That's Mm -hmm. terrible. But the mafia saw it as an opportunity. They were like, that's an untouched market. We can make some money. They called it Gayola. Yeah. I'm not kidding. They did. So they bought up all the old abandoned bars and restaurants and reopened them as gay bars masquerading as private clubs, which sounds kind of nice, but wasn't. Because now they knew where they all were. Well, they also, why do you think the Stonewall was such a fucking hole? It was an abandoned building that they just went, now it's a bar. Well, I mean, Vegas can't be choosers. Oh, I guess not. Uh, And if they wanted to make it nice, they could have made it nice. They couldn't. That's the problem. That's we'll true. get it. We'll... Okay. Let's use the Stonewall Inn's very own history to demonstrate how this happened, because that's what we're talking about, right? The Stonewall Inn buildings at 51 through 53 Christopher Street in Greenwich Village neighborhood of Manhattan were constructed as double wide horse stables. So this should tell you about how big this place is. They were just like places to park your horse when you were in town. <laughs> <laughs> so not very big. The older of the two buildings is 51 Christopher Street, and that was built in 1843. And the other structure, 53, was built in 1846. At some point in time, the bottom floor was a bakery for a little while. Cute. Super cute. And the owners lived in the upstairs apartment. In 1930, the building's owner, Henry J. Harper, hired architect William Bayard to combine and redesign the structures in the arts and crafts style, and he gave it the aesthetic it has, kind of to this day. But he put columns on the front. They get rid of them later. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Meanwhile, in 1930, a man named Vincent Bonavia had opened Bonnie's Stonewall at 91 7th Avenue uh, South, near the Christopher Street buildings. According to historians, it may have been named the Stonewall after a lesbian autobiography by Mary Cassell of the same name in an attempt to subtly welcome queer women. Like, I know your books. Come drink here. Yes. But at this point in time... That's that's cool. They're having a cool, fun, awesome, speakeasy type time because this is also during Prohibition, mm-hmm. which means it was like, we'll have tea, but in your teacup, it's full of rum. Mm. Good times, but also not long lasting. The bar was raided in December of 1930 and Bonnie Stonewall relocated to 51 flat through 53 Christopher Street in 1934 after Prohibition was repealed. So it comes with a history that includes catering to gay clientele and secretly serving alcohol. Right. So this is just in its legacy. The eatery had become Bonnie Stonewall Inn by the 1940s, which changed the Stonewall Inn restaurant sometime in the 50s. The interior of the restaurant was destroyed by a fire in the 60s, and it was subsequently sold in March of 1965. The new owners tried to get the restaurant back on its feet, but by 1966, the restaurant had closed and the Stonewall Inn stood vacant. Remember, there was a fire inside of it. This is a burnt out vacant building. It is not in good shape. Mm, Okay. Enter the mafia. 1966, four members of the Genovese crime family paid $3,500 for the Stonewall Inn. Nice. Steal. Turning the restaurant into a gay bar. In fact, it was one of several gay bars operated by the Genovese syndicate in New York City because they knew that the LGBTQ plus community not only needed places to go, but they also needed protection 
a service for which they could demand regular fees. So the mafia is like, we're going to keep you safe, but you have to pay to be in our club. Okay. Stonewall's owners could not obtain... Like the VFW. Yeah, yeah, sure. (laughs) Stonewall's owners could not obtain a liquor license because state law in the 1960s did not allow bartenders to legally serve the LGBTQ plus population. But members of private clubs could bring their own alcoholic beverages under New York state law. Accordingly, the Genovese's acquired a private club license for the Stonewall, so on the outside, everything was legal. That's how you got around the rules. He said, no, we're a private bottle club. Hey, of course, they still had liquor they sold behind the bar, but yeah, don't talk about that. The Genovese boys renovated the exterior, and these people knew what the fuck they were doing right away. They blacked out the windows so you couldn't see inside from the street, which means you could, like, gay it up all day long and no one could tell. Mm-hmm. And reinforced the wooden front doors with steel plates in anticipation of police raids. So they knew shit was going down and they prepared for it. They added peepholes and several locks to the front doors. The operators also placed two by four pieces of wood behind the windows so the police could not easily enter through the windows during a raid. The interior was repainted black because it hid the fact that it had been burnt to a crisp a few years earlier. Did they repair the damage? Oh, no, they did not. No, no, no. It was still totally burnt out mess. Right over yep, it. they just painted right over it with black. Can't Hides yeah. everything. You can't yeah. tell. Um, but this kind of goes with the theme because LGBTQ plus bars tended to look intentionally run down back then so that straight patrons didn't want to go inside, which by today's standard sounds ridiculously backwards. Who's bringing in the straights to class up the joint? I know. <laughs> Absolutely This whole time, I'm just like, <laughs> like, this doesn't seem right. This is backwards. Yeah. <laughs> that's not who you give a dive bar to whatever but the Genovese's did retain the Stonewall restaurant's old name simply because they didn't want to re- replace the sign on the front yeah I get they, it. same thing it's fine yeah the part that said restaurant the actual letters had come off the sign so it was yeah. just like the dirt shadow of the word restaurant yeah well I mean they're trying to recoup their their investment their $35 their, their 30 cents that they put in yeah. <laughs> they had to buy paint they okay did. and I'm sure they just like put some tape over it and painted right yep. over oh it. 100% yes to complete this corrupt cycle and maintain their squalid establishments the Genovese family paid off the police because okay. they're the mafia yeah In return for their generous donation, New York's finest would ignore the fact that the Stonewall was one big health code violation, and they would tip them off when raids were set to occur. Raids that they would plan for early in the night so that the bar would be relatively empty and could just open back up once the cops left. Extra stock of alcohol was hidden in the walls and in back rooms, and they would just bring it out to replace whatever was taken and go along their merry way. The cops would get to arrest the few patrons that were in the building, so that would satisfy their itch or whatever they needed and everybody wins except for the gays so who were not winning yeah it's super ridiculous of if course they just let it go nobody would have to be blackmailing anybody yeah but i guess there'd be no money to be made i guess not stupid and of course the bar staff had to make sure the clientele didn't dip into the hetero territory because then you're going to compromise mm-hmm. the integrity of the place it's just to be safe so there were systems put in place this is kind of fun Quote, visitors were greeted by bouncers who inspected them through peepholes in the door. So you would walk up to the door and some of you just look their little eyeball through a peephole. The bouncers accepted almost any LGBT individual. This is a quotation, so I do not have the extra long abbreviation. I'm sorry. Who wanted to enter, but they screened out straight patrons and undercover police officers as much as possible. So if you were going to the Stonewall, you needed to dress gay. Mm -hmm. You had to look gay through a peephole. Mm -hmm. Bring it. Admission was granted to would-be patrons who, quote, looked gay or who had visited the club before. So you also had to have a history of being there, as well as new patrons. And if you were new, you had to come with someone who could vouch for you. Okay. People under the legal drinking age were also frequently admitted, which is something you can do when you're operating outside the law. In keeping with private club regulations, patrons were required to sign a logbook upon entry. The logbook also served to screen out straight patrons. Then, and it looks just like a list of the most ridiculous things you ever heard. Like the names were Donald Duck, Elizabeth Taylor, and Judy Garland. No one's giving their real names. Right, right. <laughs> Which makes uh, American Horror Stories Elizabeth Taylor kind of a fun little tie-in. Mm. And if a visitor wished to leave the bar and return the same night, the bouncers would stamp their hand. And this says, this quotation says individual ink. 
I think it's invisible ink. Oh, for sure. <laughs> That's incorrect. Everybody got an individual there, ink. This is my ink. It's yeah. purple. Only I use my individual ink. And then if they all stood together, they'd create a rainbow. Beautiful. That would have been much nicer. Yeah. But I think it was like black light sensitive. Yeah, for sure. Ink. That way they can go to work the next day. Mm-hmm. Yep. And we know that there were like lots of dim black light situations going on in this, in this inn. Now, for a long time, this system worked. I get, I guess you could call it works. I mean, it, it, it did what it did. Nearly all the gay bars in the city were eventually run by mobsters, which is interesting. Every gay bar run by the mafia. Yeah. None of them run by gay people. And those that weren't run by the mafia went out of business real, real fast. So long as the mafia was bankrolling the cops and the gays were forced to congregate in squalor behind closed doors, it was business as usual. <laughs> Just see them like trying to be like, we're going to open up a better bar. It's going to be clean. The toilets Ugh. are going to work. <laughs> if only. And that <laughs> brings us to 1969. Ooh. Now, Leslie, you've had to sit there and listen to me blather away for hours and hours. Why don't you tell us a little bit about 1969, the era, the politically contentious, contentious era of change that we're entering? Well, sure, Holly. Thank you. So it was a wild time in 1969. The fashion was all hippies. All hippies all, all the time. All hippies all the time, especially for the younger crowd. They loved a fringe suede jacket. Ugh. Who does half tan, psychedelic prints, and hemp. I don't know why they were going after the gays. <laughs> <laughs> it was a year of Woodstock after all, and there were still vestiges of more rigid 60s. I need everybody to take that in for a minute. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about happening was happening at the same time as Woodstock. Yeah. So crazy, right? Yeah. There's like Mad Men and Woodstock. How do they <laughs> exist in the same fucking world? I don't know. Oh, it's so wild. Okay, well, speaking of Woodstock, so we all know what that is. Also, I did do, um, I couldn't find my fun fact sheet because okay. we did 1969 before. I'm sure we have. So some of these, I feel like I remember, I don't know if we said them or if I just read them before. Okay. But they were, I think there was like in a Ted Bundy. Oh, uh, yeah. So anyway, um, Jimi Hendrix insisted on being the final performer at the 1969 Woodstock and was scheduled to perform on Sunday at midnight. He didn't take the stage until 9 a.m. Monday and played for two hours to a relatively small audience. Some considered Jimi's version of the Star Spangled Banner at Woodstock controver controversial and disrespectful on August 16th, 1969. Oh, boy. The Beatles originally planned to have an album titled Everest. However, the band didn't want to travel to Mount Everest for the album <laughs> cover photo shoot. This led the album title change to Abbey Road, uh, Abbey Road, which was the street right outside their studio. <laughs> They're like, let's do Everest. They're like, no, let's just walk right outside. <laughs> oh, my God. That's really funny. Yeah. What's the street we're on? Let's settle for that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. The Domino Pizza logo has three dots because that's how many stores they opened in 1969. And in 2018, they now have, uh, so this one was by 2018. I meant to look up the number for today, but they have over 14,000 stores worldwide. Oh, I want to see that many dots. I know. So give me all the dots. <laughs> David Bowie released his single Space Oddity nine days before Apollo 11 landed on the moon. Well, well, well. Yeah. And Apollo 11 landed on the moon. <laughs> also that. <laughs> the space race is going on. Yeah. This is a crazy freaking time. It was a crazy time. Donald and Doris Fisher opened the first Gap store on August 21st in San Francisco. Look at that. Yeah. The Brady Bunch, Sesame Street, The Flying Circus, and Scooby-Doo all debuted this year. Oh. Mm -hmm. About 90% of American school children walk to school. I walked to school when I was mm -hmm. little. Me too. Well, sometimes. Yeah. That was a little far, but I could ride my bike and scoot. Scoot it up. <laughs> yeah, scoot it up. I lived really close to my elementary school, so okay. that was fine. On May 1st, 1969, Fred Rogers appeared before the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee requesting funds to help support the growth of national public television. I love that speech. I like watching. It's beautiful. It. It's so good. Oh, I love Mr. Rogers. I love it. Um, in 1969, Neiman Marcus listed a $10,000 kitchen computer 
in its Christmas catalog, which came with a cookbook, apron, and a two-week programming course. None were sold. (laughs) (laughs) None were sold. (laughs) I like that. I like that it came with a two-week programming course. And an apron. Yeah. Now we just have YouTube. I wish I knew what it was supposed to do. I know. I'm going to look it up while you keep going because now I'm dying to see it. (laughs) What? Okay. All right. Well, while you look it up, I'm going to get our game ready. You ready for this game, Holly? I am so well. Because it's 1969 and we just got to sing about it. Wait, this computer is crazy looking. (laughs) The Honeywell 316. It, It It's like... First of all, it's three separate pieces. <laughs> it's like very big. And it's this woman like the advertisement. I don't know. I guess it's just one. It looks like a space station dock or something. It's insane. I don't know what it was supposed to do. Push a few buttons and presto, a shiny orange, red and white black machine will compute the perfect five course meal. No more silly culinary errors. The days of your wife slaving away in her Chanel apron will vanish into memory and all those blinking lights will add to your holiday cheer. It planned menus. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. I had, wow. I couldn't figure out why we needed a computer. That's so crazy. Uh-huh. I bet some women wanted it and their I husbands they were like, did. no. I thought the packaging was probably a waste of time and wouldn't sell. Well, yeah, I guess it didn't. I guess so. It was based on the Jetsons. Okay. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. People did actually buy this machine, but not that many people. Okay, okay. Well, nobody bought it in the in the Christmas catalog. <laughs> no, they didn't. I guess not. That's, that's so funny. This is like a very weird, specific, giant thing you would yeah. have in your kitchen that was like, oh, you should make duck and broccoli and cherry pie. And here are recipes. I like it. But then you still had to make it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It doesn't do anything for you. It just says your party should have these foods. Right. But they have books for that. And this huge computer, Leslie. Yeah. Julia Child, wasn't she around? Yeah. (laughs) You could impress people with your giant weird computer. If, If the lady of the house wanted to build her family's dinner around broccoli... She'd have to code in the green vegetable as 00011010000 and the kitchen computer would then suggest foods to pair with broccoli from its database by speaking its recommendations as a series of flashing lights. Oh my God, no <laughs> woman would want this. And then I you're decoding the lights. This is awful. <laughs> decoding the lights. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh my God. What foods go with broccoli? I need a computer that is... 10 times the work as usual to help me. (laughs) (laughs) Buy some cheese and call it a day. Cheese goes with everything. You're fine. Oh, Lord. Chicken. Yeah. Hello, chicken. What a steak. Broccoli goes with fucking everything. Yeah. Relax. (laughs) Sorry, continue. I find this very funny. I know. That is really funny. I'm glad you looked it up. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We're going to do some songs. Okay. Yes. And you can either. Join me, okay, or tell me the name of the song or the band. Okay, we'll see what we'll see what I can do. Okay, we're gonna start with my favorite. Okay, left a good job in the city, <laughs> working for the man every night and day, and I never lost one minute of sleeping, worrying about the way things might have been. They will keep on turning. Proud Mary, keep on burning. Yes, Proud Mary. Rolling, rolling. One more. Rolling on the river. Yes, okay. Proud Mary. Yeah. I I always like how he says turning and burning. Toining. Toining. Beyonding. That Ike and Tina. Or well, that was the version. That was the Credence. Clear That's Credence water first. Okay. Revival. We all know the other one's better, but it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jojo was a man who thought he was a loner, but he knew it couldn't last. Jojo left his home in Tucson, Arizona, for some California grass. Get back, get back, get back to where you once belong. Is this from the uh, fabled album Everest? <laughs> the Beatles? No. No. What but it is the Beatles. <laughs> It's the Beatles and Billy Preston. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I see the bad moon rising. It's all credence all the time. <laughs> I see trouble, trouble on, on the way. way. 
Yeah, that was another Credence yeah. one. Bad Moon Rising. Yeah. Credence Clearwater Revival. They were just really good then. They were so popular. Yeah. The Beatles were like, we got to climb Everest. We got to <laughs> climb Everest. We're not going to climb Everest. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Kitchen computer, tell us what to do next. Terrible idea. <laughs> Sugar. Oh, honey, honey. <laughs> You are my candy girl, and you got me wanting you. Who sang that? The Archies. <laughs> From the Archies comic. Yeah, yeah, obviously. <laughs> so good. Um, but yeah, that, those were some of the so some of the top songs. And they were playing those songs <laughs> on the jukebox in the filthy storm. Oh, yeah, uh, probably oh, yeah. not, honestly. But yeah, <laughs> I also think Oklahoma. Um, like where the wind comes sweeping down yeah, the plains. That, oh, okay. that was like the big, uh, well, there was a lot, a lot of Broadway that came out, but I think maybe, because that wasn't, I think they did like another revival of it. In There's been lots of revivals. Yeah, but that was Oklahoma. like a big, that was like a big revival okay, sure. year for Oklahoma. Um, promises, promises. There you go. More musicals. More musicals. But yeah. Jesus Christ Superstar was recorded. In 1969. We love the Bible. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) A lot. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's been a while since I sang. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought it back to the table. That was fun. Okay, so besides all of the fun music and those weird facts about 1969. Which who doesn't love? Now I know about the kitchen computer. Now you know. Very thankful for that. There was also a lot of uh, social shit going on (laughs) yeah it was a contentious time (laughs) yes um so this is from an article from uh usnews.com where else would i get my news you know (laughs) the us news is yeah Yeah, that's the one (laughs) so this is this is a bit of a quote so in 1969 the rancor and fear were rooted in a deep concern about the future among white americans who felt that their place in the nation's hierarchy of power and respect was being undermined by the pervasiveness of social change sound familiar exactly it's the, <laughs> the post-world war ii thing yeah. Is exactly yeah on the other hand long don trouted groups such as african americans and other groups including grievance filled college students were losing patience with the system and felt that the american dream was out of reach or outmoded trends that also exist today obviously mm-hmm. um social pressures that had long been pent up were suddenly released amid an extraordinary cyclone of change that fed upon itself um this was also so president uh richard nixon took office this year as well mm-hmm. so we know him as a president as a president <laughs> i don't know why i can't say that word it's okay a president he came in as like we're going to fix this country. Mm-hmm. Everybody's going to get their dreams. Mm-hmm. But it was really like this small group of, you know, yeah. like the one percent. Exa- exactly. But this, but like these other, my, like the silent, I don't know, just this other group of people thought that their dreams were going to get met. And of they were course, like, finally, I have, I'm being heard. So and yeah. Similar. So similar. The Trump election. I know. Um, we're living in it now. Yep, we but, are. Um, He used issues such as support for law and order, backing the Vietnam War, and raising doubts about the aggressiveness of the civil rights movement to attack his adversaries, curry favor with white voters, and drive wedges between races and economic classes. Um, So, yeah, so there was just a lot of contention. Yeah, we're not far off the Civil Rights Act. That Mm -hmm. was, I believe, 1965. We're in 1969. Mm -hmm. It's not been around for long. Yes. And so I, we briefly, brought up Woodstock. And again, we may have talked about this in a previous episode, but that is one reason why Woodstock was this like anomaly because there was, there was all of this tension happening in the United States. And then this one place, just there was all these different kinds of people that Mm -hmm. came to, that came together. Yeah. And it was peaceful. Yeah. Like it it wasn't the Woodstock that recently happened. It wasn't Woodstock 94 of no. our youth where there was just mud slinging and nightmares. Yeah, it was not that. It was like their cops did not need to be called. Like it was a it was very peaceful. That's what they always talk about mm-hmm. it. That's like why it was such a big deal. Like everybody was out there for three, four days and just had a wonderful time. Yeah. There was a couple babies born. It was I'm lovely. Sure. It sounds lovely. It was lovely. And so, and that was, you know, that was the idea of the hippies, just like peace, love, and 
let people just live their yeah. lives, man. But they were radical extremists then too, hippies. Yeah. And and the Vietnam War did play a huge part in a lot of the yeah. protests that were going on. I mentioned that people in the Stonewall used their draft cards as identification. Mm -hmm. And if I haven't, I'll mention it later on. <laughs> they did. Yeah. So th there was just a lot of a lot of unrest. There was a lot of unrest and there was what we'll probably going to be hearing more is this need to be like not be silenced anymore. Yeah, they've had enough. People are frustrated. Mm -hmm. They're done with being shoved down. They're done with one way of mm -hmm. living and doing things. And that's all coming to light at this point in time. Yeah. So if, you know, if the white Americans want to yell about wanting to be white Americans, mm -hmm. <laughs> then the other people can yell about what they want too. <laughs> yeah, sounds right to me. <laughs> Everybody needs to be heard. Yeah, and this is the first time where that was brought into play, where mm -hmm. everybody was going to be heard, yeah. basically. Yeah. So it's a very interesting, very tumultuous, very ch giving way to change type of time. Yeah. Thank you, and Leslie. It was 1969. Yes, it sure was. And now for the main event. June 28th, 1969 at 1.20 a.m., the clientele at the Stone Wall was a mix of regulars like Queen Marsha P. Johnson, a smoky, joyful, ethereal being with a husky voice who would tell anyone who inquired about her gender that the P stood for pay it no mind, mm. which I like a lot. We will also have a half an hour coming up on her probably next. That is probably our next half hour okay. because it is in fitting with the theme. And there were also some brand new folks at the Stonewall that night, people who had heard about the infamous Stonewall and wanted to experience it firsthand. After all, it was the only establishment that allowed open dancing. Okay. None of the other ones had a dance floor. Did I forget to mention that? Not only was there a dance floor, which most clubs like this didn't have at the time, but same-sex couples could actually slow dance together. Remember, blacked out mm -hmm. windows, dance floor, do whatever you want. Newsday, yes, the respected establishment Newsday, wrote, quote, here the young men with the delicate wrists and bobby pins in their hair come to dance the night away with one another. It was in uh, Newsday, news just to remind you all. And it was a huge draw. Earlier in the evening, two, unbeknownst to everyone, two undercover officers had entered the Stonewall Inn. Remember, entrapment, big thing. After spending hours observing everyone, collecting so-called evidence in their mind cameras like little moles, they asked to use the bar's phone on which they called the police station to begin the raid. Yep. So yeah, so these assholes were just being like, holding hands, making out, dancing together on a date, just like categorizing it in their head to be like, who do we check? Uh, and I have to mention there are a lot of people there in, uh, some are in full drag and, and some people are just either actual trans people or they just, that's how they like to dress. They just express mm. themselves in a certain way. I mean, nowadays we have the terminology to talk about this. They didn't back then. Everybody was a transvestite. That's just mm -hmm. how it went. Just in case that comes up. So they call in the reinforcements. They send four officers in dark suits like the men in black and two patrolmen. When the officers kicked on the lights and started shouting orders, unanticipated chaos began to erupt. First of all, the staff had not been tipped off this time. Normally, because of the payoff agreement, they knew when this was going to happen. Nobody knew. And second, this raid was happening at 1.20 a.m., which is... Peak business hours on a Saturday night for that kind of establishment. And the bar was fucking packed. This wasn't two drag queens and 15 gay men at 7 o'clock on a Thursday. It was 200 people that had already been drinking. And I don't know what kind of Rambo shit these cops thought they were going to pull, but they were wrong. This is not what they were used to. Mm -hmm. Usually during a raid, here is what went down. Embrace yourself, it's fucking awful. During a typical raid, the lights were turned on and customers were lined up and their identification cards were checked. Those without identification or dressed in full drag, and this is a quotation, by the way, were arrested. Others were allowed to leave. Some of the men, including those in drag, used their draft cards as identification, which is so depressing. Women were required to wear three pieces of feminine clothing and would be arrested if they were found not wearing them. Female police officers would take customers dressed as women that they found questionable 
to the bathroom to verify their sex, upon which any people appearing to be physically male and dressed as a woman would be arrested. Typically, employees and management of the bars were also arrested. What did I tell you? It's real uh, German mm -hmm. up in there. Usually this happened without incident, but that night the patrons of the Stonewall had had the fuck enough. And there were a lot of them. First, a lot of the people in the bar had never experienced a raid and were justifiably terrified. I mean, everyone was scared, but if you didn't know that things like that even happened, this was a fucking rude awakening. Mm -hmm. People tried to rush, rush out the one door the building had. Remember, it only has a front door, no other doors. It's a fire catastrophe and the bathroom windows in order to escape, but they had all been blocked, which meant that all these people were now trapped in there and told that they were just going to be arrested. People were not just terrified, they were cornered. And when you can't flight, the fight is going to come out. Patrons simply began saying no. No, they wouldn't show them their ID. No, they wouldn't unpack what they were wearing. No, they would not get in line. No, they most certainly would not go into the bathroom and take off their clothing for an officer. And finally, no, they would not silently file into police cars. Fuck that. The police decided to take everyone present to the police station. They're like, okay, if you're not going to agree, get in the car. We're going to take you all to the police station. Why do you think that's going to happen? After separating those suspected of being cross-dressing men, I think mostly it was just men, in a room in the back of the bar. At this point, the cops who did not like to be challenged started to get real cocky. They decided they needed to frisk everyone and started putting their hands in places they shouldn't on the women in the building. This, in case you're wondering, is fucking sexual assault, not a cheeky way to assert dominance. This turned up the level of discomfort to 11. This was not going to calm anything down. Nobody was intimidated into being quiet. They were fucking mad. The cops started arresting people and herding them onto the front lawn to be loaded into the paddy wagons, which much to their surprise, hadn't arrived yet. Mm. Those who were not placed under arrest were released from the front door. But this time, they didn't leave. And a crowd, upwards of 100 people, quickly gathered. Police had begun kicking and shoving patrons out of the bar, but their impotent violence wasn't stopping anyone that night. Some customers, released by the police, performed for the crowd by posing and saluting the police in an exaggerated fashion. The crowd met them with applause. Mm -hmm. A bystander shouted, gay power, and someone began singing, we shall overcome. An officer shoved a drag queen who responded by hitting him on the head with her purse, which I love that little detail. And then the cops saw fit to respond to this, by clubbing her over the head with a nightstick. Appropriate. Hit you with a purse and you're going to get out your fucking baton and hit them in the head. That's appropriate police violence. As the crowd began to boo, and then the fighting started. It started the way a fuse that wound through the grounds of the stone wall before exploding might. Word spread fast and the residents of Christopher Street were swarming the stone wall. The police, woefully outnumbered by what has now become five to 600 people who gathered didn't really know what to do. Because again, remember, the police thought they had the upper hand and they were just going to do this real quick and shut the place down. Secretly, these cops, these rogue, cocky, bullshit cops, thought they were going to be the ones to shut this place down. Yeah. The first people they put in the paddy, paddy wagons were the, the mafia that owned the joint. Also, not your best idea. Some of the police began grabbing people they thought might be valuable, including activist folk singer and mentor to Bob Dylan, Dave Van Ronk, and Village Voice columnist Howard Smith. Ten officers barricaded themselves, Van Ronk, Smith, and several other handcuffed detainees inside the Stonewall Inn, quote, for their own safety, or so they said. Those in attendance likened it more to a hostage situation. The police are now locked in this building with these people they have handcuffed. What, what does that look like to you? Yeah. Garbage cans, garbage, bottles, rocks, bricks, anything they could find were hurled at the building. This broke the windows. A crowd uprooted the parking, a parking meter. They pulled a parking meter out of the ground and used it as a battering ram on the doors of the Stonewall Inn. The doors that are reinforced with metal because the mob knew what they were doing. The mob lit, I don't mean the mafia, the, the crowd lit garbage on fire and stuffed it through the broken windows as police grabbed a fire hose. Now remember, this place is going to go up like a fucking tinderbox because it does not file, does not follow any like fire code violation. Like it's nothing. It doesn't fire, can't talk. It doesn't follow any safety precautions, nothing. It's just a box mm -hmm. with no windows. So the, the police are like, get the fire hose. 
but because it had no water pressure, because the bar has no fucking water, the hose didn't work for dispersing the crowd. It just made them mad. Right. <laughs> That's what happens when a building is not up to code. Mm -hmm. When demonstrators broke through the windows, the police inside unholstered their pistols. The doors flew open and officers were standing there with their weapons drawn, pointed into the angry crowd, threatening to shoot them. Let me repeat that. Police threatened to indiscriminately open fire into a crowd of 600 civilians. What the whole fuck? Right. Just then, sirens were heard and the fire trucks arrived. Well, thank fucking God. When the violence broke out, the women and trans men being held down the street at the Women's House of Detention, says the ladies' prison, joined them by chanting and setting fire to their belongings and throwing them out onto the street below. Um, the tactical police force of New York City um, arrived to free the police trapped inside the Stonewall or the ones that were detaining hostages. One officer's eye was cut and a few others were bruised by being struck by things that were thrown at them. Oh. Poor little guys. Oh, so sad. So sad too bad. The tactical force formed a phalanx and attempted to clear the streets by marching slowly and pushing the crowd back. But the crowd openly just made fun of the police for doing that because they are much more clever than any crowd I've ever heard. The crowd cheered, started impromptu kick lines, sang, created rhymes and chanted. One participant recalled, quote, the police rushed us. And that's when I realized this is not a good thing to do because they got me in the back with a nightstick. Another account stated, I just can't ever get that one sight out of my mind. The cops with their nightsticks and the kick line on the other side. It was the most amazing thing. I think that's when I felt rage because people were getting smashed with bats. And for what? A kick line. Ugh. Yeah. By 4 a.m., the streets had nearly been cleared. Many people sat on stoops or gathered nearby in Christopher Park throughout the morning, dazed in disbelief at what had transpired. Many witnesses remembered the surreal and eerie quiet that descended upon Christopher Street, though there continued to be electricity in the air. Thirteen people had been arrested. Some in the crowd were hospitalized. That's the people who went to the hospital. And four police officers were injured. Almost everything in the Stonewall Inn was broken. Inspector Pine, who was leading the charge, had intended to close and dismantle the Stonewall Inn that night. But he got a lot more than he bargained for. But it wasn't over. The following night, the uprising only grew in numbers. Remarkable to many was the sudden exhibition of homosexual affection in public. So suddenly they were done being ashamed of who they were. One witness said, from going to places where you had to knock on the door and speak to someone through a peephole in order to get in, we just, we were just out. We were in the streets. Thousands of people had gathered in front of the stone wall, which had opened again, even though it was like a destroyed piece of rubble, choking, the Christopher, choking Christopher Street until the crowd spilled onto adjoining blocks. After 2 a.m., the tactical force arrived once again, and the street battle ensued until 4. Then the weather got bad. It rained for a few days, so everybody had to chill out for a minute. Mm -hmm. And on Wednesday, things reignited. Another explosive street battle took place with injuries to demonstrators and police alike. Local shops were getting looted and arrests of five people occurred. The incidents on Wednesday night lasted for about an hour and were summarized by one witness as, quote, the word is out, Christopher Street shall be liberated. The riots ultimately ended on July 3rd when the NYPD dispersed the protests. Quote, the feeling of urgency spread throughout Greenwich Village, even to people who had not witnessed the riots. Many who were moved by the rebellion and attended organizational meetings, sensing the opportunity to take action. On July 4th, 1965, the Mattachine Society performed its annual picketing in front of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. So every year, the Mattachine Society would gather anybody who could get there and picket City Hall in Philly. Uh, and they called it the annual reminder, because these are very polite homosexuals. Sure. Organizers Craig Rodwell, Frank K. Frank Kameni, Randy Wicker, Barbara Giddings, and Kay LeHusen, who had all gone to this event for several years, they took a bus there along with other picketers from New York City. So they went to Philly. Since 1965, these particular protests were very civilized. Women wore skirts, men wore suits, the marching was controlled, it was quiet and organized. But this year, Rodwell remembered feeling restricted by the rules Kameni had set. When two women spontaneously held hands, Kameny broke them apart, saying, none of that, none of that. Rodwell, however, convinced 10 couples to do more of that. 
They wanted them to hold hands. They wanted them to be who they were. Things were different now. Participant Lily Vincenz remembered, quote, it was clear that things were changing. People who had felt oppressed now felt empowered. Rodwell returned to New York City determined to change the established quiet, meek ways of getting attention. Gone were the days of wearing your suit and dress and standing to politely advise. One of his first priorities was planning Christopher Street Liberation Day, which is what we now know as Pride. Hmm. So did what happened at Stonewall change laws? It didn't right away, actually, but it was a start. The country has moved two steps forward and one step back in a slow, determined march ever since. But Pride, which had stretched from Christopher Street Liberation Day to the whole of June, from New York City to all 50 states, has only grown. We've come a long way since those days, but we certainly aren't perfect. As of right now, 11 states still have laws against consensual sodomy, which should be shocking to everyone. Yeah. However, they are not prosecutable due to the binding precedent sent by the, set by the case of Lawrence versus Texas. But let's call them out anyway. Why not, right? Those states are Florida, Georgia, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana. Michigan had a partial repeal, but not total. Mississippi, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Carolina, and of course, Texas. So what is Lawrence versus Texas? In short, it was the case that makes prosecuting consensual sodomy unconstitutional. And when you involve the Constitution, it is nationwide. So, that's right. (laughs) So, when you are inevitably reminded this month that Pride started as a protest, first of all, now you know. Mm -hmm. And second, I want you to remember two things. One, it still is. And two, this fight started because people just wanted to be themselves and to be happy. By any and all means, keep fighting but also live as they wanted to live and be unapologetically happy. And don't forget, we are proud of you. Yeah. For more information on laws regarding the LGBTQ plus people and their safety in your state, please don't hesitate to click the link titled Safety by State in the show notes. We are proud to say that New Jersey has one of the highest ratings and that we are considered a safe haven state for anyone seeking gender affirming care. The more you know. Toast? Toast. Huh. That was a lot. Yeah. I don't even know how to toast one person. <laughs> like, I know. Or even a few people. There are so many people. Yeah. Well, to all of them. <laughs> to all of them. <laughs> to, to Ensign Enslin. Yeah. Our very first American slandered and paraded out of town. Yes. I thought that story was fucking fascinating. So interesting. And to, like, literally anyone, either protesting or celebrating this month or standing by people's side. It's so important. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, uh, and, yeah, I just felt the need to kind of provide a little little groundwork of history for everything that we see. Yeah, thank you, Holly. You're welcome. And if we were visiting relatives in the city of Sodom, we, we would, would be dead. dead. Thank you for listening to the We Would Be Dead podcast. Hit subscribe now to never miss an episode. Rate and review our show on iTunes. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Would Be Dead Pod. And join our Facebook group to discuss the podcast and more. Eat it, Christian weirdos. You're doing it wrong. <laughs>